Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday edition of Winners and Winers Radio. I am your host, Scott Steen, lead handicapper at winnersandwiners.com. And I am your co-host, Scott Reichel, senior handicapper over at winnersandwiners.com. There you go. And this is Winners and Winers Radio. Give us an hour and we'll give you the winners. It's what we do around here, everybody. We've got a lot of fun stuff to talk about today. Of course, we're going to be taking a look at the baseball card, talk a little Olympics. We're going to talk a little NFL. What else are we going to talk about, Scott? A little bit of hockey sprinkled in there. A little bit of the hockey sprinkled in. we got a little donkey of the day coming up. Of course, we stay tuned. We'll have our bet the farm play. There to there towards the end of the show. And uh yeah, that's 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 it. Too. You have you have a good day today, Scott? I know I know you kind of had a you had a tough tennis play, didn't you? Uh, I did. I actually had two technically, because I had one which was a play that I gave out, which was in Nishikori in the Olympics, minus one and a half sets. Won the first set, lost the second, won the third. So it's always upsetting when they win the match, but they don't actually cover the spread there. Are you like and, me? Are you vindictive when, vindictive when somebody doesn't cover? Do you just root for them to lose? Uh, in this case, I was sleeping because they were playing oh. at about three in the morning. So okay. I, I wasn't thinking anything at the time. I was just hoping that I won when I woke up. Generally I also, speaking. I also had a, usually I, uh, yeah, I, I kind of root for the guy to lose after okay. uh, they lose. I feel like everybody does. But yeah. anyway, I also had a money line parlay, which I put in which had a minus 1,400 favorite in it, and he lost. Oh, God. Which was just really, really dumb. Guy just won a tournament, and then Alcaraz decided to lose in three sets to some random guy who was about 300 rankings below him, 400 sure. rankings below him. I'm not even sure. Not good. Not good at all. And I know you were telling me that was the first game of your big parlay. <laughs> uh, it actually was. Uh, everything else won, so kind of unfortunate. It's brutal. That's absolutely brutal, my friend. Well, my day wasn't uh, – my my, uh, my picks, I had the uh, under in the Miami Marlins game. Miami Marlins offense just went nuts, so that was uh, not helpful at all, putting up seven runs. We've talked about it before. They do that once every two weeks. Yeah, that's about right. That's just that's about right. It is what, it, it's what keeps their numbers from being just absolutely horrific is just the random game where they put up crooked digits in about three different innings and mm-hmm. – end up with seven to 10 runs, but then but I did redeem myself on my free play of the day over there at our YouTube channel. I had the Detroit Tigers and the over in a correlated parlay, Scott, that played, that paid plus 457. So I will, uh, I, I will take that all day or day as they hit the grand slam in the well, night. So well, we're going to, we're going to talk about that in, in a minute or yeah. two. I was yep. gonna say, yep. Yep. that's right. We do, we do have that one on our list. So, yeah, well, all right, we'll do that. Hey, speaking of the list, let's get to it, shall we? Let's uh, start the show as we do, talking about the people that, well, kind of had the kind of day that uh, maybe Scott had. Yeah, thought they had a winner, thought they had a great pick. Everything looked like it was all peaches and, peaches and cream until things went absolutely south. Folks, all you can do when your bets lose well, you can get on the show if you happen to have a radio show and gripe about it. But if you don't, you just call the cops. All right, Scott. Well, let's start it off with tennis. No, I'm kidding. Let's start it off in the American League. Hey. Hey. Hey, everybody. It's the Twins money line. If you had the Twins on the money line, first of all, you paid a hell of a price because they were like minus 210 favorites, which was ridiculous because they're the twins. But you know what? You felt good. You felt good. They were up 5-1 going into the ninth inning. The Tigers, they hit a grand slam, Scott, tied it up, and then they did nothing. Either team did nothing for two innings. And well, in the uh, in in the excuse me, in the tenth inning, they did nothing. In the eleventh, the Tigers scored one run in the top of the inning, and that was enough. As the Twins suffered a horrific base running blunder to start their half of the eleventh inning, getting Sano thrown out at third on a ground ball when he was trying to advance to the ground ball to the shortstop, and two more ground balls, and that was your ball game, Scott. Six five, that's a winner. You had the Twins on the money line. Oof, hope you had the over, but if you didn't, it was time to call the cops. Honorable mention on that one. I actually changed it on the sheet uh, right when the Twins ended up 
uh, losing the game, but I also had the Twins team total over five and a half on that mm-hmm. list because they had five runs through the first four innings. Yep. You're rooting for the grand slam because you want more at bats. Yes. They tie the game, ninth inning, no runs. Guy on second in the tenth inning, no runs. Guy on second in the eleventh inning, no runs. They didn't score for the final seven innings. It's not good, you know. And, and I even talked about that when I handicapped that game on the free pick. You know, usually it's the Detroit bullpen that has just been absolutely horrific, and they do have some really, really bad numbers. But when they got swept by the Royals this weekend, it was the starting staff that pretty much let them down in all three games, and that was the case again tonight. The bullpen was very, very good, and hats off to the Tigers for shutting them down there for the last seven innings. Well yep. done, indeed. But transitioning, actually, because of the team that the Tigers faced off with over the weekend, you had the Royals. And if you had the Royals on the reverse run line at plus one and a half against the White Sox, you are also feeling really good because they were not only covering, they were winning outright by two runs after seven innings. And the next thing you know, the Royals' bullpen, unlike the Tigers' bullpen, not good, gave up four runs in the top of the eighth, lost five to three. You can rip up your ticket right there. The only thing that you cannot afford is to be outscored by four runs or more in the final two innings, and they did. And did nothing offensively for those two innings as well. So, yep. if All right. So, finishing it up, if you had the Indians plus one and a half on the reverse line, on the reverse run line, taking on the Cardinals, another team that was leading late in the game. They're up 2-1 after six. They're down 3-2 to two after eight. All you have to do is keep the Cardinals from scoring a meaningless run in the top of the ninth. Just hold them. Hold them. Take your, take your L and walk it and, and walk away. Nope. Indians had to put a little flair on it. They gave up a run in the top of the ninth to the Cardinals. They scored nothing in the bottom of the ninth. That game ends 4-2. If you had the Indians plus one and a half, tough night for the reverse run lines. Better call the cops because you got ripped off. A lot of bad bullpens in the league. A lot of bad bullpens in the league. Holy moly, is that an understatement. Well, Scott, there were some people that were happy today. And, of course, those are the people that had those nice, easy wins where you don't have to sweat, no extra inning heroics, no walk-off grand slams, nothing like that. You thought you had a winner, and you did. You were sitting in the rocking chair. So... Looking at the first rocking chair, you had the Braves and the Mets. And if you had the over nine in that matchup, you had a nice easy winner because the Braves scored 10 runs in the first four innings by themselves. And the game ended 12 to five. Very good. Very good indeed. Braves maybe making a move there in the East, Scott? Uh, Maybe. I kind of question with – Acuna being out and with Soroka not being able to come back this season, I don't think they have the overall pitching. I think that's going to be an issue for them. But are the Mets as bad as people think they are? Because people keep waiting for the Mets to to fall apart. Right. They're not exactly blowing teams or anything, but they're they're kind of just doing just enough to not disintegrate into a million pieces. Yeah, and it, it it really hurts having DeGrom, of course, on the injured list because that's, you know, pretty much what, a, a guaranteed win every every fifth day. So that part sucks. Uh, I'm not sure the Mets are going to be able to hang in there. I've got – of course, I'm speaking optimistically, Scott, because I still have a ticket on the Braves. So we'll see what happens. And I don't think the Braves are done. I think they're going to trade. I think they're going to uh, – I think they're going to be buyers at the deadline. I think they have too much veteran talent on that team to not be buyers at the deadline. Agreed. Agreed. Well, Scott, if you had the Reds Cubs first five over five and a half, and you know, we're big fans of the first five plays around here. Uh, you were in great shape. They put up four runs in the first inning. That's exactly where you want to be. Uh, you had to sweat a little bit in the second, but in the, in the third inning, they took care of business, put up a sixth run in the third inning and ended up four to two after five. That's over five and a half Red Cubs first for First five over five and a half, sit in the rocking chair because you had an easy one. And the last one was probably the easiest winner of the day. If you had the Brewers on the run line, the Pirates made a last-minute pitching change because Tyler Anderson was allegedly traded, and then he wasn't, and he started throwing bullpen sessions, and then he got traded after the game. So I found that whole thing kind of bizarre, but they ended up using another pitcher, and he stunk. 
because the Brewers scored three runs in the first, five runs in the second, and won nine to nothing. So if you had the Brewers on the run line, the game was over after about 20 minutes. It's one of those situations where you wonder about the guys that can't start for the Pirates. Like, how bad are you exactly? Well, Man, if Chris, you follow the Cardinals, bad. sorry to interrupt, you follow the Cardinals, you know that Oviedo is a guy we like to fade a decent amount. Yes. The Pirates had their own Oviedo, and apparently he's even worse. Are they related? I have no idea, but based on how they're pitching, I'm assuming they're brothers. <laughs> Terrible brothers from indifferent mothers. Very nice. Well, Scott, we now to talk about it. There is a one glaring organization. It's not going to be you again, by the way. This There's is, a- I actually have a counter argument to that, by the way, about yesterday's, but we'll, we can talk about this one first. Okay. Um, it's going to be the segment that you and I have really grown to love. We hope that everybody loves it as much as we do. Scott, let's find out. Let's spin the big wheel and find out Who's wearing the feed bag today? Who indeed is donkey of the day? The last one. It's always my favorite. You you, you kept a pretty straight face this time. Congratulations. Truth is the audio kind of got a little bit lower, so I couldn't really hear the full presence of the, you know, of the Yelp or whatever you want to call it. So the break. It was let, us, there. let us let us bray, Scott. Let, let us bray. Okay. Anyway, looking at the donkey of the day, we're gonna be looking at hockey. And I know you might be wondering why we're we talking about hockey when the season ended about hundred degrees two, outside. Ago. There's no ice. But you want to look at one interesting development yesterday. It involved the trading market, and that involved the trading of the Vezina Trophy winner in Marc Andre Fleury, because he ended up being traded from the Vegas Golden Knights to the Chicago Blackhawks in a complete salary dump for nothing. And the interesting part about that isn't even just the trade itself. It's the way in which Marc-Andre Fleury found out about the trade. Now, we know that when you actually trade a player, whether you see in the movie Moneyball or whether you're not, you just know common sense, they usually call you into an office. They give you a bunch of empty compliments saying, thank you for what you've done. Good luck for your future endeavors. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. That's kind of how it goes, right? Right. So Marc-Andre Fleury found out in a very 2021 technological way. He found it on Twitter. They didn't tell him. He was going on Twitter, and there were reports that came out that he was traded to the Blackhawks, and he didn't know. And then he called the team after he found out, or his agent did, and Vegas said, by the way, you've been traded to Chicago. And Fleury said, well, I might just retire. So that whole thing is going to play itself out, but the donkey that it has to be Vegas for just the lack of proper trading yeah, etiquette, you got to tell the person you're trading them. That's dreadful. I mean, they're kind of, they're kind of two-part donkeys of the day. For starters, you trade the Vesna winner, the guy that pretty much single-handedly pretty, got you to the finals, right? Uh, de- uh, kind of debatable because they did the Western Conference finals, but – he got benched halfway through. He he led them to the uh, division title. Wait, well, did they win the division? Did no, they, they the did not. Title? No, they, they did sorry, not. Sorry, Colorado. They had the won same the record as Colorado, but Colorado won the tiebreaker and ended up having the best record. In, That's in correct. The but the point is that they were really good in the regular season because yes. of him. Yes. Yeah. And you know, again, best no winner. Yeah. So, and I guess you know, don't even mention because I know we've got listeners in Tampa Bay. So don't even talk about <laughs> don't even talk about Flurry being the Vesna winner because I'm sure that's a sore subject. But I digress. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's a two part two parter for Vegas for trading him for starters and for the horrific way they notified him. Very very classless. Congratulations, Las Vegas. Wear that feed bag with pride because you are the donkey of the day. Can you send All him right. an email or something? What's that? Like, do you yeah. not have Flory's private email address that you can? Yeah, just... but can you shoot him a text? Do you, anything, voicemail. Send him like a carrier pigeon. Like, do something. You got to let him know before you let the public know. How about you send somebody, you know, from the club over to his house or something? You know, anything. Yeah. So anything. I actually want to ask you something, by the way, about yesterday's donkey of the day because it was me talking about Team USA being favored by about thirty against Iran, and they were right. favored by about forty-two. Yes. According to the line moves that actually happened, T- 
Team USA was around like 45, went down to 30, and then went back to 42 and a half. When did, when did they go down to 30? I believe it was in Vegas. I don't know about offshore, but I'm pretty think, sure Vegas books actually moved it down to 30. At some I point. think you're drunk. I never saw 30 anywhere. And I see it on a reliable source from Twitter. So I'm oh, just well. saying. So there the might be person. a chance that maybe, I mean, it was wrong anyway, because it ended up boomeranging back another 12 and a half points. But right. somebody else was as dumb as I was, and they're working for a Vegas sports book. No, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. The same guy that set the WNBA line. Uh, could be. He <laughs> saw last year's total and didn't realize what happened. Very good. Hey, Scott, this is where the part where we get to talk about winnersandwiners.com. Now, whenever I wear my winners and winners stuff, I got a shirt and I got a hat. People always ask, number one, that's a great name. They always, what do, what, what do you guys do? What is, what is winners and winners about? Scott, what's, what's the best way you would sum up winners and winners? Uh, it's a free site for you to get all your betting information as fast as possible. Yeah, very, it's very cool. It's, it's organized perfectly, very, very user-friendly. The, the UX is supreme. Can we say that now, Scott? I think you can. All right, very good. It's, it's, an, absolutely, it's an absolutely user-friendly site. It has information on every game, every single day. Like Scott said, it's always free. That's the best part about it. So make sure if you are serious about spending, betting uh, sports, it is an absolute must that you stop by and check out winnersandwinners.com. They are our title sponsor, and both of us came to work for winnersandwinners.com by finding them when we were doing handicapping. So we both used them before we started working for them. Great site. You should check it out, winnersandwinners.com. All right. So, Scott, there's really only one – well, there's not only one, but there's one big, big sports story that everybody's talking about right now. And you and I wanted to, wanted to address it. And I know that you've got some thoughts. I've got some thoughts, but uh, Simone Biles withdrew in the middle of the, or at the, actually the beginning of the team final uh, due to mental health problems. Um, is mental health a, uh, would you, is that a legitimate reason for, I don't know, can we call it quitting on your team, Scott, or withdrawing and kind of leaving your team in the lurch is it does it make a difference number one is it a legitimate excuse and does it make a difference if it's a individual sport versus a team sport see when i was when we were preparing the sheet i'm the one who kind of phrased that question and i know that you originally thought it was a little bit harsh but i thought it was a fair question to actually just bring up for conversation mm -hmm. because you have seen other players in the past for example in uh tennis you had osaka who ended up leaving for a couple of months because of mental health. And the argument there would be, well, tennis is an individual sport. So her decision to opt out isn't really impacting other people, so to speak, where you can make the argument for gymnastics and a team event. If you spend all of the time for the last four years preparing for something, so did the other people competing with you. And by you, what, for whatever reason, leaving halfway through or in the beginning, and your team ends up losing anyway, don't you – I feel like there is a difference in team sports compared to individual sports. Now, before one and air, I was a lot more passionate about my stance before I actually knew what the rules were. Oh, you had some world-class bad takes. I, was, I wouldn't say it was a bad take, but I really didn't understand the full rules of the Olympic meets. I thought that everybody had to participate in every single discipline. Right. So I just thought that Biles was getting a zero for her team in every single event. That was not the case. So no. it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. I still have a little bit of a hard time with it, but it's not really about the mental health aspect. It's about the fact that she just spent so much time leading up to the Olympics and all of the practice events and the qualifying and stuff, just bragging about being the greatest of all time and having the, what is it? You call it a unitard? What they, what they wear for gymnastics? Yeah. Leotard, unitard. I, I forgot what exactly it is, but. Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Uh, for the sake of it, track suit. We'll go with the track suit. I don't know the difference between a jumper and a romper. Either. I don't either. But the point is the, <laughs> wardro the wardrobe that, you, that the gymnastics participants wear, Biles had that customized goat logo put on her outfit during the qualifying to symbolize that she's the greatest of all time. And I do find it a little weird that – she was bragging about being the best of all time and how she was going to win. And basically when you say you're the best of all time, that means you don't exactly think too highly 
of everyone else competing in the event, and then you leave after messing up the first vault jump, I thought it was kind of weird. Didn't you think that's a little bit weird? I'm not yeah. talking about from a mental health angle. I just mean from the idea of proclaiming when nobody asked you, I'm the best in the world, here's a statement, deal with it. And then now, as soon you, as the pressure she, comes on this year, you shrunk in the moment for whatever reason. Is she really that upfront about it, Scott? If you put a customized goat like in, or whatever on your thing when you didn't have to, yes, I think you are. Plus, she's in, been in a bunch of commercials for the last about five months. I'd, I'd be more curious to find the circumstances where you had to do that. You said if she didn't have to. <laughs> I think when you put that on there, it's pretty much voluntary each and every time. Pretty much. Yeah, I don't know, Scott. I, I think, personally, I think she did the right thing for her team because she knew for whatever reason she didn't have it. And if you listen to people that know a lot more mountain gymnastics than we do, which is a long list, but they say that it is incredibly mental that you, that, you know, everybody has the skills for the most part. It's all about being able to execute and having your mind right, et cetera, et cetera. For whatever reason, if you know your mind isn't right and you know you're going to hurt your team, I think the smart thing to do is exactly what she did. She stepped away, let somebody who was better prepared in that moment step in for her, and they ended up taking second place. They ended up taking the silver uh, second to the Russian Olympic committee, which uh, just don't even get me started. But so the thing is, I think it was a selfless thing to do. I, I think it was the, I think it was the right move because they, they showed her warming up on all the different disciplines and she like fell off the balance bar. She landed out of bounds uh, on the, on the floor exercise to just, she just didn't look good. She didn't look like herself. And for whatever reason, she knew it. She took herself out. They were able to rally. And the only reason that they weren't able to win the gold was because of her terrible vault in the, in, in the, uh, the first round there. So other yeah. than that, they beat the Russians and ended up taking the gold and ended up taking the silver. And she was on the sideline the whole time, very, very enthusiastic, cheering on her teammates. I got no beefs with Simone Biles, not one. I had more beef pre-show before I realized that every person did not have to participate in every event. I thought that she was just taking a zero every single event. That I would have had a hard, a, a hard time with. Yeah. But since you take – you give one either delegate or one, you know, contestant to do each whatever, I was fine with the move. But I do th – maybe it's just me and how I try to be a very humble individual just based on my personality. Mm -hmm. I don't like to brag when I win. I – like I'm honest when I lose, you know, I recognize in my industry, which is completely different than gymnastics, but you get the point. I try to be a pretty humble guy. I think you know that about me. And just that's the part that bothers me when you self-proclaim yourself as the best of all time. And then I don't know if it's karma or whatever you want to call it, but everything just falls apart immediately after you do that. That's the part that kind of sticks out to me. But as for the mental health stuff, I don't have an issue with what she did. I just have an issue with her bragging to everybody that she's the best before leading up to the Olympics. Okay. Is that All a right. fair distinction to make? A lot cooler than the take you had an hour ago. It was because I didn't know the rules for the Olympic gymnastics. All that right. changed That changed a lot. I didn't realize that like one person could do each discipline. I thought everyone had to do it. All right. Let me ask you, Scott. If you had four years to practice, you had, you had your expenses paid, you could practice every day, every week, whatever. What sport could you compete in? Four years of doing whatever... Yeah, whatever you'd have to train, you just, you just train constantly to be the best as possible because you're going to the Olympics in four years. What, what sport do you pick? Can I pick Olympic lifeguard? You cannot pick Olympic lifeguard. No, that would be a great gig, though. But I've already got that locked up. If I had to pick one, I would probably pick something that you don't have to start at a really, really young age in order to be good at. Okay. I'd probably go archery. Archery? Yep. Because conceptually speaking, I feel like if you do it every day, it's the same technique. It's the same, whatever. Right. And I feel like that could limit some stuff as opposed to swimming where people are just thrown into a pool at the age of two, you know? Yeah. So I'll go with archery. You okay. I was thinking one of the shooting sports, I kind of forgotten about archery thinking maybe one of the, you know, the air rifle or the, the target stuff. Either or same idea. 
Well, my my problem is and this is again I, all hypothetical because I've got I've got a bad right eye where I get a torn retina that never healed. But anyway, it was my is my dominant eye. It's the one that I always when I shot I would close my left eye and, and use the right eye, and it's no good now. So I would be a terrible shot. But all things being equal, if I still had full use of both eyes, it would be a shooting sport for sure. Yep. You know, because you know, I, what what am I going to play? Team handball or volleyball? You know, I'm a short fat guy. I, nothing. Nothing's. I four years from now maybe I could not be fat, but I'm still going to be short, so I'm not going to be much help on the volleyball court. Uh, I don't like sand; it gets everywhere. I don't care for that. So yeah, I would do some of the shooting stuff. Mm. And for a winner, curling for sure, hundred percent. I wish I was I was better at skating. Yeah, which is something I've never actually been good at. I'll yeah. waddle like a penguin; I won't fall over. So that's okay. I guess a step in the right direction. All right. As for winter, bobsled. Ooh, bobsled, living on the edge, huh? Just jump in the, just jump in the thing and let it do the work. You don't, you don't want to be the driver or anything. Well, if you're talking about potentially winning a gold in a limited amount of time to prepare for four years, then wouldn't I pick something where the machine's doing at least some of the work? Yes, absolutely. So I'll go with bobsled. Okay. All right. Very good. All right, Scott. Well, let's talk about a little football here. Xavier Howard requested a trade from the Dolphins yesterday. I'm really torn on this one, Scott. He led the league with 10 interceptions. And by all accounts, he's a very good cornerback. They signed him to a five-year deal before Didn't 2000. They, they, they just did that like last year. Before 2019. Yeah. I mean, he was the highest paid cornerback in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Now, since then, he's no longer the highest paid cornerback. He's the fifth highest paid cornerback. And he thinks the deal that he signs two years ago is disrespectful. They're not... They're not recognizing the quality of work that I do. So apparently when they made him the highest paid cornerback in football in the history of the football two years ago, that was not enough respect. That was not enough recognition. And now he wants to be traded. Okay. So a couple of things here. First of all, let's, let's talk about the fact what, what's he worth on the market, Scott? If I had to quantify it, I think Jamal Adams sabotaged the entire market for defensive backs. Because he was worth, what, two first-rounders? Or it was either two or three with a starter involved. And you can tell, you can, you can talk about Jamal Adams being a good player. That was a terrible trade for Seattle last year. That well, was not good. I don't, know, I don't know who gives up that kind of booty for a, for a safety. I'm just saying. They did. So well, that's, that's how – yeah, that's ridiculous. So that's not going to happen. So that's the ceiling that you'll never see again. Right. Now, as for Howard – since he doesn't want to be there, I don't know if he's going to hold out potentially just because he doesn't want to be there. He says he's at camp, so he won't get fined. I got to assume I would trade up to one first-round pick for him. Realistically, he'll probably go for a second. You? Yeah, I guess. I just uh, – do you think they Do you think they trade him? I think that they will. Really? I do. You th- you don't think that's like just absolute blackmail? I do. I didn't say that it was proper business practice, but the salary caps in sports and how you keep making people the highest paid for a day before the next guy gets the biggest contract. The way that these players negotiate contracts and the way that these teams just cater to the needs of the players every time, no matter what, is ridiculous. And the only person who seems to actually stand up to that is – arguably the coldest shoulder in the history of sports and Bill Belichick, who's not afraid to cut a guy because he acknowledges that the contract that he signed is clearly not indicative of what he should be getting paid. So let me ask you, do you think it would be less of a problem if one of the cornerbacks who made more money than Howard wasn't on the same team? I think that would be a problem because Byron Jones is of course the guy you're referring to who had a solid year as well. The only thing that I'm kind of confused with is that he got that contract and he was the top paid corner, and yet, did he overperform for the Dolphins because now he wants to leave because he thinks he wants to get paid more? Like, would he have asked for more money if he had five interceptions instead of ten? Yeah, I don't know. That's 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 a great question. I I uh, I don't think they trade him. I don't I don't think they do. I I, I think I think talent wise, they should keep him. Having said that, Flores, of course, is from the Belichick family, which is what I, which is why I discussed it before. And I am curious 
at what point do you sacrifice the talent of an individual for the collective chemistry of the unit? And if you're afraid of having a negative minded player who's going to be viewed as a distraction, then you might have to wonder if Flores, who's a Belichick disciple, will simply just pull the plug on him. And I think there might be a chance. Could be, because you know the one thing that Miami isn't afraid to do is trade veterans for draft picks. They don't care. I also know why Howard wants to show up for practice every day. It's because he looks so much better when two is throwing him picks three times a practice. Well, that's, that's, that's also true, too. But, you know, they do have Jason McCourty that they could, they could plug in there. Obviously, he doesn't have the talent of Xavier Howard, but it's, that's, not, that's, not a, that's not a ton of drop-off right there. And receptions a- is nuts. I know. Record. I know. It's crazy. No, and he's, a, he's kind of a unicorn, Scott. He can play press coverage, and he can still play the ball. So he's a very valuable player, no question about it. And that would be a very intimidating Miami secondary again if they were able to keep him in the fold. Personally, I think they, I think they give him some kind of new deal thing. I really don't know how they're going to go about doing that. We can wait and see, but I do have to wonder if he continues to run his mouth, if that's going to cause him to get run out of town. Yeah, that's a good, that's a, that's the good question. And, you know, he, he traded it. He, he changed agents with the express purpose of holding their feet to the fire here. So I didn't know Scott Boris uh, was the agent for football players too. Yeah, it's not, he's not Scott Boris, but. Somebody Based on how he's acting for a new contract, it sounds yeah. like Scott Boris. Yeah, it's a very, very Scott Boris kind of thing to do. So, all right. Hey, speaking of contracts, Scott, Steven Strasburg, remember him? I thought that contract was going to age horribly, and it did. Having he said was, that, he, the Rendon contract also aged terribly, so the Nationals were going to lose regardless. He was good that one month. Uh, Strasburg having season-ending neck surgery. Neck, neck surgery. Started seven games on the last two seasons combined. Has five more years left on a seven-year deal, of course, guaranteed, because it's baseball. $245 million. That uh, is a lot. That's a substantial That's a substantial amount. What is that, 35 a year? Yep, exactly 35 on the nose. So here's the thing. Is that the absolute worst contract in baseball or sports? I think it has to be, right? I mean, you're going through the list of bad contracts. And, of course, the leader in the clubhouse who has had his plaque retired for about three years is Chris Davis. And we all know how bad that contract is. We know how, The Orioles know how bad it is because he never plays for them, and yet he's still getting paid. So that's always going to be an all-time terrible contract. Stan's contract with the Yankees isn't good, but at least he's playing. This has got to be on the list, right? I mean – you're not even halfway through, and I don't know if Strasburg's going to last another year, let alone another five. This is an Agreed. awful contract. Yep, I agree. It's, it's probably the worst baseball contract. Now, I will present for your approval a couple of other sports that <laughs> make baseball look like pikers. So he's making, he's making $35 million a year. So Scott, can I interest, can I interest you in Jared Goff at thirty three and a half million a year? How about I that? I think I think that football contracts are a bit misleading though, because they keep trying to raise the price of the highest quarterback, and now Mahomes and company are getting forty plus million dollars every oh, year. Mahomes is the highest paid quarterback, or I think he's going to be the highest paid athlete in the in the United States. He also invested in Sporting KC yesterday. He did. He did. Bought a share of Sporting KC. His wife owns the. The ladies soccer team here, he's got a little piece of the Royals. So, yeah, he's, he's setting down some roots in Kansas City. Yeah, he's going to run for mayor in about 20 years. Uh, owns do. every damn he owns every damn team in the, in the, in the city. So, yeah, you got, you got golf at 33 and a half. You got Kirk Cousins at 33. Carson Wentz at 32. Uh, Scott, any guesses, any wild guesses who the 11th highest paid quarterback is in the NFL, making Garoppolo? $28 million a year. Is it Garoppolo? It is not. He is one, Mark, he's one step ahead of Garoppolo. I thought it was a great guess. Uh, spoiler Foles? alert, he doesn't start. Is it Nick Foles? It's Jacoby Brissett. Ah, okay. 
Nick Foles also has a uh, a terrible, horrific contract as I would, well. I would, I'd like to believe that I was lukewarm on these because I just mentioned other terrible contracts for quarterbacks. Yeah, yeah that's not bad. That's See, not but bad that's the all. thing, though, is that you have to keep in mind that even though some of these contracts are bad for quarterbacks, there's a lot of them. So it, either the contracts are bad or maybe the quarterback market is completely atrocious and people are just reacting to the market. Well, and they, know, pitching, and they know they know how important it is. Correct. So that's what I'm saying. So you're going to see desperate teams. So even though I do agree those contracts are bad, at least there's a little bit of justification for it. Whereas right. you have so many pitchers in the league, so many options. I know that sure. Strasburg, in my opinion, uh, shouldn't have won World Series MVP, but he won it. I would have given it to Soto. But still, I get why they had to pay him or why they thought they did. He's had injury issues his entire career. Like you could tell there were red flags as soon as it was happening. Yep. And no I would – if I had to choose between the two, I would have picked Rendon. I also would have lost because his contract's been terrible too with the Angels. But that Strasburg contract you knew was going to go badly before he even signed it. I think that's a pretty safe way of putting it, isn't it? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I thought that was I thought that was absolutely ridiculous with his injury history. Scott, as far as basketball goes, those guys are making a lot of money. Most of them earn it. But kind of interest you in John Wall at forty four million dollars a year. That's a bad one. That's a really bad one. That's that's an that's an awful contract. That that really really is an awful contract. So see, that's an awful one. But you can make the argument that the contract itself allowed the Wizards to get Russell Westbrook. So at least okay. some potential good came out of it because now Washington could flip Westbrook maybe for some picks. Okay, Meanwhile, well that's, you, you that's can't some 3D flip chess it. there, buddy. Uh, it's 3D chess, but Strasburg is immovable. No, yeah, nobody's taking Strasburg. That's what I'm saying. So if you want to compare it with sports and everything like that, the wall contract's not as bad because he at least got flipped for an asset. Okay. All That's right. how I'll, I'm trying to find a silver lining in All a right. really, really hideous contract, but Strasburg's just stuck there. Yeah. Yeah, he is. And they're and they're on the hook for all of that. That's and they're about to pro and they're most likely about to trade Scherzer and potentially trade Turner. Yeah. So, well, you know, and that's what the, we didn't talk about that. I mean, we might hit that tomorrow, but yeah, they talk about Scherzer being on the block. Talk about what the, what he could bring. We will uh, we'll ta we'll table that. We'll talk. I would not that. trade Trey Turner for the record. I think Turner's a fantastic player. I think whatever the Nationals get back for Turner is not going to be enough. Okay. You? We'll see. Um, we'll see what I he gets back. I think he's probably the best leadoff hitter in the league. They're going to get their. They're going and maybe Acuna, of course. They're they're going to get prospects, so it's all, it's all going to be it's going to be, it's going to be hard to judge. I'm just saying that Trey Turner. People keep talking about Scherzer. Turner's got a lot of value on his own. He's a great player. True, true, absolutely, absolutely true. Yep. So, all right, my friend. Well, as always, remember you are listening to Winners and Winners Radio. Give us an hour, we'll give you the winners. And that's what we're fitting to do right now, Scott. We're going to take a look at today's baseball card. Now, this is, of course, the Wednesday card. So we do have a, a couple of day games there. A couple of one game that I know you and I uh, really had some interest in is a uh, 1 p.m. start time. So this show obviously will be after that. That was the uh, Detroit with Peralta over Hap. We like to fade Hap and. Uh, Detroit getting plus money on there. Seems like another fadeable spot, but alas, uh, no, no that. We're not going to see Odori Odorizzi and Kikuchi. We don't get to see the Cooch go as plus money. God, Scott, brutal, brutal getaway day. Um, so we go with what we have. And the first one we have, Scott, going to be the aforementioned Washington Nationals as they go up against the Philadelphia Phillies. Nationals send Patrick Corbin to the mound against Zach Wheeler. Phillies minus 176 is where that opened, and you've seen nothing but Philadelphia money come flying in. It is now minus 200. Total has gone from eight to eh, starting to see some eight and a halfs creep up there, Scott. You and I haven't liked Pat Corbin for a long time. Has anything changed for you? I don't think so because we know how bad the Nationals bullpen has been when it comes to closing the games when their starters actually pitch well. So, no, I don't exactly expect him to suddenly 
A, figure it out, and B, for the bullpen to hold it down. You can go through Corbin's last couple of starts. Four and two-thirds, six runs against the Dodgers. Six innings, two runs against the Padres, so good for him. Start after, Padres again, five and a third, six runs. And five and a third, five runs against the Orioles. That's no bueno. I see him getting crushed. We were we like, but he does occasionally get blown up, and the Nationals' offense has been decent lately. I'm looking at the over. I am hoping that I can find a a four-and-a-half team total for Philly, but, of course, that's clearly not going to happen. It's going to be five-and-a-half. Actually, no, I see a a four-and-a-half at minus 115. I'll take that for the the Phillies. It's got to be bet MGM, huh? Yep, of course. If you want to find really, really mispriced team totals in your favor, bet MGM. Yep, they they're not the best on team totals for whatever reason. They're the best for us, not for themselves. Yeah, they've got some very friendly they've got some very friendly numbers up there. Yeah, Pat Corbin, uh, tenor and runs in his last ten and two thirds innings. That is, uh, like you said, not good, not good at all. Wheeler Scott, he's just he's been randomly good. Um, well, he's a good pitcher. He just has a couple of really really bad performances every now and then. Yeah, he does. And in, in fact, he's two of his last three. He's given up four earned runs, and even worse than that, because against the Cubs, he gave up seven runs total. Only four of them were earned. So, yeah, it's – but, like I said, he was very good his last time out against Max Freed and the Braves, giving up just one earned. Over seven innings, striking out eight, and he, and he is he is a strikeout guy. He's got, he's got 38 strikeouts over his last five starts, so he's doing a very nice job there. I'm going, team, I'm going team total Phillies. That's yeah, I think that's probably I think that's probably the safe play. You don't have to worry about this Phillies bullpen because that's a uh, that's that's another adventure that I don't really want to get involved with. They are a bad bullpen and even worse on the road. Five ten ERA at home. So yeah, I want no part of that. All right. So uh, next up, hey, you know I'm mean, loving. We just talked about it. it's Max Freed going for Atlanta against McGill. Jimmy McGill. Better call us all uh, for the New York Mets. Mets, Scott, opened them up minus 125. That's where it is. Total was at eight. That's where it is. Are we a believer in Max Freed yet? Is he back? I just have a really hard time having faith in any NL East team when they play against another NL East team because I just have no idea what's going to happen. Somebody's got to win, Scott. Somebody's got to win, but I, I, you just can't tell because every team in this division is just Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, they really are. They are. It's well for starters. I don't think any of them are that good. That is definitely true. Um, now, are you a McGill fan? Do you like what he's done so far? I'll give him props for providing a little bit of quality performance as a pitcher when the Mets were expecting nothing out of him when the season started. Yeah, I think Freed's better. Obviously, uh, if I had to pick anybody, I'd probably go Freed in the spot, but. Once again, it's a situation where if you take plus money blindly with the NL East team, that's the underdog. I don't know what the numbers are for the underdogs in the division matches with the NL East. I could assume the underdogs are profitable. I would think you'd be. I would think you'd be up money. Absolutely. Yeah, Max Freed gave up four his last time out, but before that, he was very good against Tampa. He's kind of been Jekyll and Hyde, Scott. Mm. I'm going to. Uh, I'll take a little. I'll take a little spin with McGill there. I'm not. Sir. I'm not necessarily uh, that impressed with Max Freed yet. Uh, he had a very good last year. I'm not sure he's totally recovered from that injury. So I'll, uh, I'll fade you there, my friend. Uh, Cincinnati at the Cubs. Tyler Molly goes against Zach Davies uh, for the Cubs. Uh, Cincinnati is the favorite here. Scott opened up at minus 108. And now stands at minus 112, minus 115. A little bit of Cincinnati money coming in there. How do you feel about this one? I feel like it's a situation where I like the Cubs at home usually because they're 31 and 19 at home. Right. Having said that, I this Cubs team is just waiting to blow it up as we speak. And I really have a hard time backing them when you could easily have a guy pulled right before the game, which a lot of people don't always factor in, which you can't really factor in because there's no way to know. But would right. it shock you if Baez randomly gets pulled an hour before game time? Of course not. I'm going to lean to the Reds, but it's a complete pass for me. This game could go either way. You? Okay. Well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to 
go the other way because it's fair. The Reds for me are just a little bit more. I can't even say consistent. I just think they're better. They don't pl- they don't play consistently better, but I guess if I had to lean one way, I'll go with a team that's still playing for something? Question mark. Yeah, uh, it is. It is hard to think. It is hard to figure out which one of these teams because it looks like both of these teams are going nowhere. The Reds are still over 500, though, so you can make an argument maybe they're not officially waving the flag on catching the Brewers, being seven back. Cubs are nine and a half back. They're below 500. They're done. Like, they're shipping people. Yeah, I, I think that's true. But here's the thing with Tyler Molly. You know, this is a guy that made us some money early in the season, but it's really weird. It's another one of those guys that had this coincidental drop-off in June – uh, first three, first 12 starts of the season had an ERA 3.32, whip 111. All right, that's pretty good. Uh, since then, in his last eight starts, ERA of 4.78, whip of 1.41. In that stretch, he has given up nine home runs and plunked five batters. Reds nine and three in his first 12, four and four since. Uh, again, not going to be the one to accuse anybody, but it seems like quite a coincidence, eh? It does. I've just never been a big Davies guy. Okay. All right. Good enough. I think. Uh, I think I'll fade you on. I think I'll fade you on that one as well. You're fading me on a lean, but sure. <laughs> I'm leaning the other way. Yeah. Uh, anything else though? I'm looking at potentially is uh, Hawk or Hauk on the mound for Boston. I know okay. he's laying about 130, 135 against Mats. We've talked at nauseum about how Toronto is really, really good at beating up on bad teams, but against good teams they stink. We like this how kid. We think he's good. So I'm going to go with Boston because they've been a really good team at home. And Toronto, not exactly good against top-tier competition. No, they are not. Then you know, And I know that you've kind of been anti-Mats from his time with the Mets. He's, it also doesn't help when you're a lefty facing that Red Sox lineup with the Green Monster in the left. That's not a great combo. No, no, it is not. You know, Mats is – he just he's just kind of there, Scott. He's four point three four ERA. Nothing really to get excited about. Um, like you said, this this Hout kid has made uh just three starts this season. Two of them were early and one of them was late, but he's been he's been pretty good. He looks like you might have a little something there. He gave up just uh one run, no earn to the Yankees, five innings or uh, four and two thirds about a week ago. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. I'm not afraid to lay the wood there with Boston. I think Boston's the better team. I agree. And like you said, Toronto, just they, they struggle with teams over 500. It's just the way it is. I like the team. I think they're going to be good, but I don't think they're quite there yet. I agree. All right. Um, anything, else that, anything else that stands out? I, you know, we've got that Dodgers-San Francisco game. I actually like the other late game. I like the over in the Rockies-Angels game. I was right about uh, yesterday. I said that I was a fan of – our boy Gomber, and they ended up taking care of business easily. But in this spot, I like the over. You got Chi-Chi on one side. You got Heaney on the other. I know Heaney was pretty good in his last start, but wind's blowing out to right field at about nine miles an hour. We've seen the bullpens. We know these teams have power. I'll take the over. Crank it up at the big A is what you're saying, right? That is what I'm saying. Do you agree? Uh, I don't hate it. I don't, I don't hate that at all. I think there are going to be some runs. I think – uh, it opened at nine. It immediately went to nine and a half. So it is still just to the under though. So maybe we'll see it creep back down to nine. But I think once the people wake up, see the weather forecast, I think nine is going to be a distant memory But that. Keep an eye on it because that's again, big difference right there between nine and a half and nine. Scott, my Royals. Oh, we had them. Remember the, from, the, from call the cops, they were in great shape last night. Of course they ended up, bullpen puking up the lead Chris Bubich goes for KC tomorrow or tonight rather against Luis Luis Giolito I can't figure out Bubich because he's sometimes awful and then other Mm -hmm. times he's good for like two months straight are you a fan of Bubich you know he's got great stuff Scott Mm -hmm. the entire (laughs) royal staff does apparently they well you know what they do it's a matter of harnessing it though but you know it's I'm really, really torn because, for starters, he's a lefty. Yeah, I'm going back to the White Sox lefty angle. Yeah, the uh, the White Sox, although, you know, they didn't do well against Minor, 
but they never do well against minor. That's that's such a that's such a weird deal. But Vubic was absolutely nails. He went, and this is what we're talking about with with his psychotic season. He goes zero runs, two runs, one run. And then he gives up three. Okay, not not ideal. Then he goes six five five five. And then last time out, we fade him against Willie Peralta. We think that's absolutely a lock because Willie Peralta has been fantastic. Bubich goes out, pitches six inning, gives up one earned run. So you figure him. I don't know. I'm going to have to play the White Sox here just because it's Bubich. It's a left-hander. He's been he's been inconsistent. I think he's going to be a good pitcher at some point, but I would take the the White Sox. Eh, give me the give me the run line too. A little extra, put a little extra value on that. Makes sense to me. All right. Um, do, do, do. Well, I don't, I don't talk, really have much. We got to talk about your. We got to talk about your Yankees, buddy. They made a trade. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Talk about yeah. Talk about the Yankees trade. I know you're excited. You're fired up. The Yankees I'm are making fired up. Moves. They tra- yeah. They, they traded two relievers to save caps. So they can probably shell out a bunch of money for Joey Gallo. Are you excited about that? I'm not going to get bothered by it. They might have a lefty bat who can hit a home run to the right porch. His tree's going to strike out a lot. It'll fit right in with the team. I was going to say, do you do you not have enough? Do you not get to see enough strikeouts watching Yankees baseball now? Uh, you could always use a little bit more. Tell me about tell me about the uh, the the young pitcher for the Yankees. Scott is Nestor Cortez. He's been surprisingly good this season. I know in the past he was kind of a long relief guy. He got thrown into the rotation because of some injuries and everything like that, but he's been good. 1.95 ERA, 1.01 whip. However, he rarely, if ever, goes five. He'll probably go around three or four. So you're expecting the Yankees' bullpen to maybe pick up the slack. Sessa's the long reliever. Not anymore. He's going to Cincinnati. So I'm curious who's going to end up filling in for long relief here. That part scares me. I think if you want to take Tampa, look for a live line. Because the Yankees bullpen with no long reliever could have some problems. I wish the Yankees could score some runs, Scott, because I really would like to fade Michael Walker. That's fair. But they can't. So first five just, under, maybe? Uh, do you believe in the kid that much? Not really, but I you were I was trying to figure out an angle for you because the Yankees can't score and you're trying to maximize what Cortez can do. Yeah. No yeah, score I mean, first inning and pray. Like, I, I don't really know what you're going for here. Maybe play under under two and a half first three, something like that. Maybe, but I'm just saying Cortez, he might pitch well, but if he does, it's going to be for about three, four innings max. Give me full game over. How about that? Okay. Way to flip the switch. Let's just let, let's just make, make that work for us. How about that? Yeah, fair enough. All right. Um, you know, I know we've got, we've got I know, I know we've got at least one left, Scott. We do some other games don't have lines up yet though yeah that's they uh no i mean i mean our uh i, I know what you're talking about i'm saying in addition to that yes abs- absolutely true trying to we see we talked about this before sorry to interrupt we talked about this before battle of well let's say two solid pitchers but some potentially tough win to deal with with the total of seven and a half between the dodgers and the giants with bueller versus di scalfani on the mound should the Dodgers really be laying 145? I know that Bueller's really good. DiScofani's been good too. The Giants are just a good team, and they still get no respect. No, all they all they do is just keep winning. That's that's it. Beat the Dod- beat the Dodgers tonight. You know, I was tempted by the total last night. Rather, I was tempted by the total, but the wind blowing out that much, I'm going to pass. I do like the Giants though, plus money. I think you, yeah, I think you absolutely have to take. You have to take the Giants there, right? I think you have to for value. Discofani's been very good, and you're gonna you're gonna pick up, you know, shop your lines, but you should be able to find plus one thirty five on that play. You know who didn't pitch yesterday for the Dodgers? I'm gonna go with Hanley Jansen. Hanley Jansen. So even if they're winning, he might pitch in the ninth, and that's always a fun time. That must be a horrible feeling to have a closer you just cannot depend on. I'm it's sure the starters despise good. him. Oh yeah, in the middle relief guys that go in there and yeah put their guts on the line, absolutely. Any interest in back in the cooch against Odorizzi? Uh, not particularly. I kind of like the over because the last couple of games in the series have been very very high scoring. 
Mm-hmm. That game's a 340, so it's going to be taking place when we're actually already on the air. But Yep, yep that's right. That's if right. it's a low-scoring start, maybe look for a live bet over because these bullpens have both been terrible in the series. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. All right, Scott, well, let's, let's get right to it, shall we? Every day, the question we are asked more than anything other than what's winners and winners is what are you guys playing today? What's your favorite play? People, people, it's like, it's like being a doctor, Scott. Uh, you see him somewhere like, hey, my shoulder hurts. Take a look at it. No, no, I won't. But we're different because we're nice guys. So we give out a play. We put our head together. We come up with the very best play that we could recommend. And this is it, Scott. If you had to put it all in the middle, if you had to bet everything on just one play, this would be it. Climb on your tractor. Put on those overalls. It is time to bet the farm. So the bet the farm play is going to be in a matchup between the Diamondbacks and the Rangers. And we like the Diamondbacks team total over four and a half runs at plus 100 on bet MGM, mostly fading Jordan Lyles, 5.2 ERA, 1.45 whip last two starts, 11 innings pitched seven home runs allowed 8.18 8.18 ERA. Not Say that good. again for the people in the back, Scott. Seven home runs allowed in the last 11 innings. In two starts, seven home runs. So that's not good. Lyles, though, also is pretty consistent because he allows a bunch of hits. He's allowing 10.2 hits per nine innings, which is the second most in the entire league. Plus, shout out Brad Keller. Shout out Brad Keller for being in the first. I did not get that answer right. Meanwhile, the Rangers bullpen, 4.5 ERA, 11th worst bullpen ERA in the league. We think Arizona has the offense, and they're getting nine at-bats guaranteed to make Lyles pay and to make the relievers pay. We think they get to at least five runs. Yep, and we basically we, we don't have a ton of confidence as far as the Arizona pitching staff goes. It's not, it's not something that we really wanted to get involved with at this point. It's, it's, mad, it's mad bum going. So fortunately he's not going to be hitting for the dime backs, but we'll try to manage anyway. That's right. So nine is a pretty good total there. You wanted to play the full game. That'd be great, but we think there's more value. Um, just taking Arizona and their four and a half. So we're going to, uh, we're going to strap on our strap on our boots, Scott. We're going to head out to the back 40 and that's going to be our bet. The farm play. It is the Arizona diamondbacks team total over four and a half at what do you say? Plus 100. Even money. Even money. Even money. That's a, that's a great play today, twice on Sunday. So uh, we'll be back tomorrow to talk about that and how well we did, of course. Well, Scott, it seems like time flies, doesn't it? It really does. We went through almost every baseball game, and I'm used to going through maybe three. I know. I know. We're, we're getting to it. We're coming, we're coming down to it. As always, we appreciate you guys checking us out today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching on the YouTube. However... You are availing yourself of our presence. We appreciate the effort. Of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to drop us a comment. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you're listening to us on the radio, on the computer, around the world, wherever you are, tell your friends we do this each and every day. We have a blast. Try to make some money. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much our motto. So, for myself, for Scott Reichel, for the whole team over here at Winners and Winers Radio, we appreciate the effort. Good luck on all of your plays. And we will see you tomorrow on... Winners and Winers Radio. Take care, everybody.